We've alluded to the intermolecular forces in some earlier programs, and today I want to take a look at them. Again, recall that we have strong covalent bonds existing inside of our molecule. However, between molecules, there exists this weak intermolecular force. There's three of these intermolecular forces I'm going to take a look at. These intermolecular forces govern properties such as melting points and boiling points. Let's begin by looking at, first of all, what's called the London dispersion force, the weakest of our intermolecular forces. We have a sample here of a substance, hydrogen gas, with its shared pair of electrons in between them. Typically what happens is these electrons, as you remember, exist in a cloud or an orbital, and they could be at a host of possible positions. At some point in time, it is possible that these electrons could move and exist at other locations. So the electron that perhaps right now might reside here, perhaps moves and spends a little bit more time closer to this end of the molecule. That then results in this particular hydrogen developing a slightly negative charge and the other hydrogen a slightly positive charge. This then influences the electrons in a neighboring hydrogen molecule. They would be repelled by the presence of these electrons and also tend to move away, creating also in this molecule a temporary dipole, a temporary situation where the molecule has a slightly negative and a slightly positive pole. This cause we call an induced dipole. Now we've created a situation where we can have a weak interaction, an attraction between the two. Now, this interaction occurs more often when we get bigger electron clouds. So if we have bigger molecules than, say, hydrogen gas, we move to fluorine, chlorine, or bromine, this would increase the likelihood of these electrons residing at one side more than another and create a stronger London dispersion force. A second situation which enhances the London dispersion force has to do with the surface area of the molecule. You might recall graphene from an earlier program. And if we have large sheets of graphene, we can also have large surface areas between them. And this also enhances our London dispersion force. So that's the weakest of our interactions and is present in all molecules. Now we'll take a look at another situation, the dipole-dipole attractions. Instead of having a temporary situation where we have create a, a dipole or a polar molecule, we have a situation where it is always happening. So for instance, between hydrogen and chlorine, we know that chlorine has a stronger pull on the electrons. That results in the chlorine becoming slightly negative and the hydrogen slightly positive. And this isn't temporary, this is permanent. It always happens. This happens also in the neighboring molecule beside it, which is slightly positive end and a slightly negative end. And as a result, we can have this interaction between the two. This happens between any two molecules that exist and are polar. It's possible that we can take if I might, for a moment, remove this. And let's bring in a water molecule. A water molecule is a polar molecule. And as a result, substances that are polar, having a negative and a positive end associated with them, they can also interact and be attracted to water. This enhances a substance's ability to dissolve in water. Hence a phrase you might have heard, like dissolving like. Now what makes a polar molecule? I'm going to look at two examples. Here we have the molecule carbon dioxide. We can recall from its earlier program it's a linear molecule. Between carbon and oxygen, oxygen wins the pull or the tug of war for electrons, moving them in that direction. And likewise, tug of war in this direction. This substance has what we call our polar bonds. Now, is the whole molecule polar? To do that, I'm going to add these dipoles together. They're like little vectors. So I have one going this way, that first one here, and now I'm going to add this one to it, tip to tail, starting here and going back. In this situation, I have no net movement starting and finishing at the same place. 
Because these essentially cancel each other out, this molecule is not polar. So again, I added together the bond dipoles and I got zero. Let's look at another situation with, say, sulfur dioxide. At first glance, a similar formula, one might think a similar outcome. However, sulfur dioxide has 18 electrons, not 16 as in the molecule above. So if I put my electron pairs here and here, I fill up the outsides. That now leads to a stable arrangement for sulfur dioxide. You might recall with three regions, this particular molecule will form a flat triangle, trigonal planar. So there'll be sulfur with that unbonded pair of electrons here, going down to an oxygen down here, and double bonded to an oxygen over here. In our tug of war for electrons, oxygen wins, so they're pulled this way, and the bond pull is this way. If I add these together now, let's look at what happens. So coming down because of this first one and now adding this one tip to tail. I don't cancel each other out. This situation leads to a polar configuration. Because this molecule is polar, it has a slightly negative end on it and a slightly positive end. We call this a dipole. So a dipole, a polar molecule, will be able to behave much like hydrogen chloride and have dipole-dipole attractions between neighboring sulfur dioxides. This would also be very soluble in water, eh, which reminds me of a something. Let's move on to the last of the intermolecular forces, the strongest, the hydrogen bond. The hydrogen bond exists between molecules that contain oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen bonded directly to hydrogen. This creates an extremely polar molecule because of the big difference in electronegativities. So this would become slightly positive and oxygen slightly negative. Also in the neighboring molecule, the oxygen slightly negative and the hydrogen slightly positive. Now, this positive charge is attracted to this negative charge, and not only the negative charge, but the electrons that are also present there. And hydrogen being somewhat small can get in quite close and quite tight with these oxygens. So the hydrogen bond is not the bond between oxygen and hydrogen, but much rather the bond between neighboring molecules that possess an oxygen-hydrogen combination. Um, I must also emphasize that the oxygen or the, the hydrogens must be bonded directly to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. They don't just have to be present in the molecule. Here's what I mean by that. Here are two molecules containing carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. This first molecule right here in this situation, the oxygen is not bonded to hydrogen. As a result, this substance would have no hydrogen bonding because the oxygen is not bonded directly to the hydrogen. This second molecule, the oxygen and hydrogen, are bonded. So this would be a candidate then for hydrogen bonding, the strongest of our intermolecular forces. In our next program, we'll finish the bonding unit by taking a look at metallic bonds.